Hi, good morning. My name is Miss Anne and I'm a teacher. And today we're going to learn about two really interesting big ideas. We're going to learn about the US Census and we're gonna learn about a vocabulary word, population. So in this lesson, you're going to understand the concept of population and how distributing resources relates to the quantity of people living in a community. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is this a little confusing? Just hang on because I'll explain everything to you in a minute. So, and then we're also gonna learn about why the US Census is super important. So, the first thing we're gonna do, boys and girls, is we're going to listen to a song. I love music. So, and this song is gonna teach us a lot about the US Census. Before we do that, let me show you this picture. So here, this is a picture of the US Census, and here's the word, census, C-E-N, S-U-S. -S. You're going to hear it a lot in this song. And the census is a survey that's mailed out to every single household in the United States. And guess what? It's being mailed out right now. Okay, so here's our song. It's called 2020 Everyone Counts. And here's our lyrics. Let me pull it up on my phone, boys and girls. Give me just a minute. Okay, and as I play this song, I'm going to track the print with my little green pointer, so be sure to follow along. Okay, ready? It's loading. It's not loading. <laughs> okay, one more time. The census counts people in homes big and small. You count if you're tiny. You count if you're tall. Because everyone counts in the U.S. of A. Everyone counts in their own special way. You count the too. counts everywhere. Count all who live with you. Sisters, uncles, grandmas, and your newborn babies too. Because everyone counts in the U.S. of A. Everyone counts in their own special way. We count all your neighbors and we count all your friends. Until we count you, the county won't end. Because everyone counts. just a couple of these verses, boys and girls, and uh, so you can learn a little bit more. So the census counts people in homes big and small. You count if you're tiny, you count if you're tall, because everyone counts in the U.S. of A, everyone counts in their own special way. So we're gonna learn a little bit, or we're gonna talk a little bit about this word counts. So here in our poem, this word counts means two different things. First, it means counting like one, two, three, four, because the census is used to count everybody in the United States. But it also means something else. So this word counts means that you are special. You count you matter and your family is special and your family counts and your family matters. So it means two different things. Okay, so now um, we're going to play a little game. I brought some friends with me, boys and girls. Aren't they cute? So here I have my little Jojo. I have Sunny Pie. I have Mr. Floofy. Isn't he cute? Look at his little beautiful floofs. And then I have Humphrey right here. Oh, he's really big and really huggable. 
Oh, I love him so much. He's so cute. And then I have my favorite little narwhal who came to join. Oh, hi friends, how are you today? You're good? Okay, so I love having my friends with me and they count because they are so special. You all are so special. And I'm also gonna count them too. So let's count them together. One, two, three, four, five. I have five friends with me. I have a group of five. You know, there's another word for having a group, a group of animals or a group of people. I'm gonna show you this word. It's a big vocabulary word and we talked about it at the beginning of the lesson. So it's this word here, population. Whoa, have you heard that word before? Population? Hmm. So let's spell it together. P-O-P-U-L-A T-I-O-N, population. What do you think that word means? I have a little picture here to give you an idea. So a population is a group of people or a group of animals. That is a population. And it could be a small group or a really big group. So here I have my population of friends and I counted them. I have a population of five, and you know what? I told you my friends count, so I really wanna let them know how special they are, so I brought them a treat. Are you guys ready for your treat? Oh, they're so excited, they're ready for their treat. Okay, all right, friends. Now, here I have my treats, and I'm going to give them to my population of friends. Okay, here I have one, two for my, Five friends? Oh no, oh no, I didn't count my population of friends before I got my treats. <gasps> this is such a mess. Oh, what am I gonna do? Oh, boys and girls, thank goodness I found more treats. Let me first count my population so I remember and then I'm gonna count my treats and make sure I have enough for my population. Okay, let's do it again. I just wanna make sure I get the count right. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I have my five friends and now let me count my treats. Okay, I have one, Oh, these look really delicious. Two, three, four, five. And you know what, this broke in half, so I'll put it together because I don't wanna give anyone a small one. So I'll count this as one. Okay, let's see. So I have five treats and five friends. Ready, one, two, three, four, five. I have enough treats for my population of friends. So boys and girls, why were we talking about population and the census? Well, I wanna let you know that the census is counting every single person in the entire United States. So the census, based on how we answer, Money is given and resources are given to households in the United States or to our government or for representation based on our population. So we have to get the count right because everybody's special and everybody matters to make sure we have enough resources like these treats to go around. Boys and girls, what can you do to help with the census? Ask somebody in your home if they filled out the census. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today for At Home with APS. I'm Miss Anne, thank you, bye. Welcome learners, it's Wednesday. We're happy you're here today. I'm Mrs. Kraft, and this is a session for third, fourth, and fifth grade ELA.
here with At Home with APS. So as you remember, this since it's Wednesday, we've been talking this week and focusing on nonfiction texts, which means those are texts that are real. The information may sound like a story, but it's true. And then you've taken that information and done some writing. So let's review what we've done on Monday and Tuesday. We looked at informational texts through different lenses. On Monday, we practiced using your senses, using your powers of observation to go out into the world and explore. With Miss Abby, you explored the sunflower and you wrote about it using your five senses. Yesterday, we read a story about a Navajo code talker and we looked at that story through the lens of numbers, how we can understand and write about nonfiction using numbers. It makes it more believable, it makes it more real, and it makes it look and us, the reader, know that you've done your homework. So remember, we looked at those years and our character who traveled through World War II as the Navajo code talker, and then he went back home. And all of those required numbers. So today we have a new lens that we're going to use as we look at nonfiction. And our new lens today is comparison. How do we understand some of the things that we haven't experienced directly? So we're gonna read a story, a nonfiction text about tornadoes. And here in New Mexico, of course, we see very few tornadoes. I bet most of you have not experienced one. Likewise, we haven't experienced tsunamis or hurricanes. We're pretty fortunate here, aren't we? But how can we understand those tragic, strong, devastating weather events without experiencing them? And one way when we're reading that writers get us to understand or help us understand is through comparisons. And so right now we're gonna look at two ways to compare things. And you know it's Wednesday. Wednesday is our vocabulary day. Today I'm gonna do something just a little bit different. I'm not gonna show you a picture and a word like we've been doing. I'm going to introduce you to two literary devices that we can use to compare. And so, when we compare things, we can use these two devices called a simile and a metaphor. We're comparing two things that are not really alike. Because if we're looking at a tornado, there's not a lot of things that are just like that tornado, especially things that we know. So as we read, I'm gonna challenge you to read as that writer and listen for those similes and metaphors in our story. But before we do that, I want to give you some examples of what they are so you know very solid in your mind what is a simile and what is a metaphor. So we have those two words, and they're both ways of comparing things. So similes are comparing two things using the words like or as. Metaphor is painting a picture in your mind. And a metaphor is comparing two things without using like or as. So you can see they're pretty similar. And I, my bet is you use these all the time at home. Sometimes it seems like it's a little bit easier to compare using a simile. So we're gonna look at that one first. So a simile. And look at this word. So this is gonna be our vocabulary word today. And it is, it's, it's kind of a little weird, isn't it? When I see it, I always think of a smile. But it's sim. I -li. Now that's not how we normally pronounce this word. Smile, if we broke it down. That's not right though. That's not how we say it in our language. And remember our English language, 
We always have some exceptions. And this word is an exception. So S-I-M-I-L-E, simile. Say that with me, simile, simile. Comparing two things using the words like or as. I'll bet you've done this before. So let's look at these pictures. We have somebody sleeping. Zzz, like a log. Have you ever said, oh, I slept like a log last night? You used a simile. How about this one? We have some clams, right, with their tongues hanging out. I'm as happy as a clam. I hope that you say that all the time. That, my friends, is a simile. I'm as happy as a clam. Let's look at some more. <clears throat> Do you ever say something is as smooth as stone? How about busy like a bee? Maybe the grown-up in your house has said, you should get busy like a bee. Thick as a brick? How about, do you keep your room neat as a pin? How about as blind as a bat? I've been told that when I don't have my glasses on. And then we take those, those are short similes, aren't they? We're gonna take those and create a long simile. The ice sculptor's hands fluttered like a hummingbird's wings. It's beautiful, isn't it? So we can use similes not only in nonfiction, but in fiction when we write, they can make that image come alive. So now that we have similes, remember, they always use like or as, we're gonna move to metaphors. Metaphors are comparing two things by saying one is like the other. And you can convert a simile to a metaphor if you take out the like or the as. So let's take a look. Look at this. So metaphor to me is when you draw a picture. And this one illustrated that really well. I am a rainbow. Are you a rainbow? I hope so. Multicolored. You've got some blues, some greens, some yellows, and sometimes some reds, right? I am in a rainbow is an example of a metaphor because it is comparing two nouns. Remember a noun is a person, place, thing, or idea, and a rainbow, but it does not use like or as. I am a rainbow. Could you convert that to a simile? If you could say that into your TV. We do that a lot. We say, I'm like a rainbow. So you could say that. That's a simile, right? I'm like a rainbow. But let's switch that to a metaphor. It becomes even a little bit more poetic. I am a rainbow. So metaphors are everywhere. Here's some examples for you. See if you've heard of some of these. The homework was a breeze. Have you ever said that? I hope so. He is my knight in shining armor. You are my guardian angel. Oh, the classroom was a zoo. We maybe have some teachers that have said that on many days. And my teacher is a dragon. Do you see how none of these use like or as? They are just comparing two things. We're comparing homework to a breeze, a gentle breeze. It was easy, right? We're comparing somebody, maybe your dad, maybe a grown-up in your house, as your knight in shining armor. Somebody else we're comparing to your guardian angel. They take care of you. Well, we maybe have all experienced the classroom as a zoo. 
and my teacher is a dragon. So we can convert these to similes, right? My teacher is like a dragon. You are like my guardian angel. So you can see how you can go back and forth. Sometimes it's good to practice writing met by writing a simile, taking out that like or as, and making it a metaphor. So here's what I wanted you to think about. Here's a metaphor, and remember I like you to draw. So we had our rainbow back here. I am a rainbow. Here's one I'd like you to get out your writing journals and see if you can draw this one. The wind was a howling coyote. Have you ever felt that way? The wind's picking up at your house and it's knocking down branches and it's blowing in. So see if you can sketch that one for me. The wind was a howling coyote. Can you paint that picture? I chose this metaphor because it kind of leads us into the story that we're gonna read about tornadoes. And it helps us understand possibly how we can relate to weathers like tornadoes or hurt weather patterns like tornadoes or hurricanes or tsunamis that we have never experienced. So the wind was a howling coyote. Can you picture that in your mind? Go ahead and sketch that down. If you'd write out that metaphor for me in your, in your writing journal, you can draw it later as you add more colors. So I'd also like you to go back and write the definition of the metaphor. Metaphor, comparing two things, saying one is like the other. Simile compares two things using like or as. And if you'll keep those in your writing journal, you'll be able to remember them because they come up all the time. Like I said, as we're reading fiction and as we're reading nonfiction. And they're gonna make you a better writer also. All right, we're gonna move forward now. So we have our wind that's howling like a, a coyote, which leads us into our story today. And our story is about tornadoes. But I want to stop for just a minute and take a look at why we're doing the things we're doing this week. And remember our essential question. We're talking about what makes an explanation effective. And so today, as I read the story about tornadoes, I want you to think about what, why do I want to read this book and what makes it effective? How, do, how am I experiencing a tornado when I've never had that experience in reality? I'm only getting it through my reading. And that's the beauty of the way we're using this nonfiction text. Let's get started and read and see if you can experience the tornadoes. So our book is called Tornadoes, and it's by Seymour Simon. So the pictures in the book are photographs. There isn't an illustrator, but there is a person who, actually many people who have taken the photographs. The book is published by Scholastic Books. Twisters, dust devils, whirlwinds, water spouts, cyclones, tornadoes go by different names, but whatever they are called, the roaring winds of a tornado can toss a truck high into the air, smash a building, and snap the trunk of a tree like a matchstick. A tornado's funnel looks like a huge elephant's trunk hanging down from a cloud. The funnel acts like a giant vacuum cleaner. Whenever the hose touches the ground, it sucks up the air. Tornadoes, from the Spanish word tronada, mean thunderstorm, have been reported in every state of the United States and in every season. 
However, they occur most often in the eastern two-thirds of the country during the spring, which is sometimes called tornado season. Wow, did you, see, did you recognize some of the similes and metaphors in this chat, in, just in this page? Let me go back. We have the roaring winds of a tornado can toss a truck high into the air, smash a building, and snap the trunk of a tree. Mm, I see a word here, like a matchstick. A tornado's funnel looks like a huge, again, like a huge elephant trunk. So we're comparing the funnel cloud of the tornado to an elephant trunk using the word like, which means it is a simile, right? The funnel acts like a giant vacuum cleaner. That allows us to picture that in our minds, right? You have seen pictures of an elephant's trunk. You've probably used a vacuum cleaner, sucking it up. So we have two similes right there. Look at that picture. A tornado is a powerful twisting column of air <clears throat> that makes contact with the ground. It is visible when it contains water droplets in the form of a cloud or surface dust and debris, or some of both. When a tornado touches down, it usually creates an explosion of dust and wreckage on the ground. If the twisting column of air does not touch down and does not produce damage, it is called a funnel cloud. Most tornadoes are local storms. A typical tornado is 400 to 500 feet wide, less than 1,000 feet long from cloud to ground, and has winds of less than 112 miles per hour. It usually lasts only a few minutes and covers only a few miles on the ground. But a few monster tornadoes are a mile wide and have the strongest winds ever measured in nature, up to 300 miles per hour. They can last for an hour or more and travel more than 200 miles along the ground, leaving enormous damage in their wake. So just to put this into perspective, we definitely have winds here in New Mexico, don't we? We have almost a windy season, but when those winds are blowing, a lot of times they are maybe 30 to 40 miles per hour. It's a pretty darn strong wind. With our tornadoes, we're talking 112. And those monster tornadoes are up to 300 miles per hour. Wow, that does put it into some perspective. And that's using the device we used yesterday of numbers helping us understand. The first step in the birth of a tornado is usually a thunderstorm. This type of storm begins when warm, humid air rises up from the ground. As these updrafts cool in the upper atmosphere, the moisture in them forms clouds. The water droplets or ice crystals in the clouds grow bigger as water vapor around them condenses or becomes liquid. The droplets or crystals begin to fall, creating downdrafts, and these downdrafts meet new updrafts, which continue feeding warm, humid air into the spreading thundercloud. This is the most violent time in a thunderstorm. A tornado may form at the edge of an updraft where it meets a downdraft. I'm going to show you the picture now so you can kind of see. That's a lot of words. What that looks like in the tornado. Can you think of an image or a comparison you could make to that? As it spirals up, right? 
it's swirling along the ground like a spiral. I want to show you some more of these pictures because they are amazing. Okay. One of the worst tornadoes of recent years struck the town of Gerald, Texas on May 27th, 1997. A thunderstorm came rumbling out of the north in the middle of the afternoon. Moving slow. We could say slow as a snail probably, right? At 20 miles per hour, the storm entered the town and several twisters dropped out of the clouds. One resident later said, the sky was black as night. What's that? That's a simile. Can you picture that? Just boiling. That's that's really a good image, isn't it? The largest tornado moved slow and stayed longer. It sat on the ground for 15 to 20 minutes. Look at this destruction. It's amazing. And I don't think in New Mexico I've experienced that. So it's hard for us to see, but of course we can see it through the pictures. And as the writer writes, through the similes and metaphors, the comparisons that are made. The Fujita Pearson tornado intensity scale, or F scale, have you heard of that? Ranks tornadoes according to their wind speed and the kind of damage they can cause. Weak tornadoes are classed F0 or F1, but stronger ones they go to F1. They have winds of 73 to 112 miles per hour. That's not even the strongest one. Strong tornadoes are F2 or F3, and they can be up to 157 miles per hour. Wow. Remember our windy season when it gets really, really windy here and my branches blow? That's about 30 to 40 miles per hour. It's really strong, isn't it? So this photograph shows an F3 tornado that hit in Arkansas in 1997. It destroyed 11 homes, damaged 57 others, and killed someone. I want to show you this picture here. Look at that scary cloud. What would you, could you write a simile or a metaphor about that? That does look black as night and boiling, doesn't it? This is an F4 or F5, 207 to 260 miles per hour. It can take down houses. It can lift cars into the air. Look at that. Wow. I just want to show you some of these pictures because they are just amazing. So here we are. Look at this destruction and debris. That was a house. Think about a comparison you could write about that tornado coming in and just blowing over that house. Like what? Like a huge giant fan from the sky. All right, well, I'm really happy to share this tornado book with you today and give you a little bit of information and it helps to understand those comparisons from these extreme weather events because they're happening all around us. Miss Abby's going to come up next and help you write about some of these comparisons in nonfiction. Hi, writers. Welcome back. This week, we are focusing on informational text. We have been reading books. We call them nonfiction or informational text. We've also been writing. Now, our essential question, what makes an explanation effective? 
when you have to explain something to someone, how do you make sure it works? How do you make sure they understand? Well, Mrs. Kraft and I are showing you at least three ways to make your explanation more effective. The first way is to use sensory details. If you're trying to describe something to someone, try using your senses. What you can see, smell, taste, hear, touch. When you use sensory details, it helps that other person make an image in their brain so that they can understand. Yesterday, we worked on numbers. We learned how authors use numbers to explain and how we as writers can also use numbers to explain. We're not writing with just digits, but we're using important years, dates, times, weights, sizes. We're using those numbers to help explain. That's a way we can make our explanation effective. Today, this is a really important way to make your explanation effective, but it's gonna take some creativity. Today, we're gonna talk about comparisons. Comparisons are when you take something you know and you compare it with something not known. A way you can tell comparisons in a book are using similes. Similes use the word like or as. And one tip I like to use is called an as as sentence as big as, as small as, as quiet as, as loud as, as with a descriptor with another as is a way to use comparisons to make your explanations effective. Now, sometimes you get information Maybe you're doing a report. Your teacher asks you to give information about the state that you live in. Okay, you can easily give facts. But when you turn them into comparisons, it makes it a little bit more easy to understand. And when something is easy to understand, that makes an effective explanation. So earlier, Mrs. Kraft was reading Tornadoes. Seymour Simon is the author, and Seymour Simon has a lot of informational books. He takes topics and uses sensory details, numbers, and comparisons to make you understand the topic. I've never lived in a place where there were tornadoes, but because of what Seymour Simon wrote about, he helped me understand his explanations. For example, That is not very clear, but it says a tornado's funnel looks like a huge elephant's trunk hanging down from a cloud. So the funnel of a tornado looks like an elephant's trunk. He took two items, the funnel of a tornado and an elephant's trunk. I've never seen a tornado in person, but I have seen an elephant's trunk at the zoo, of course. So when he used that comparison, it helped me understand. So authors 
use comparisons to explain, and that's what we're going to do today. I have my writer's notebook. I hope you do too. Inside my writer's notebook, I have so many different things inside. I have narrative stories. I have opinion writing. And this week, we're working on informational writing. So in my informational writing, I've written about sunflowers, I've written about American heroes, and today I'm going to write about the state that I live in, New Mexico. Before I write, I have to do research. On each page, starting with sunflower, I started with my research, my facts that I found out. Now, if I just give facts, yes, I'm giving explanations. But when I add comparisons, it makes my explanation more effective. So I have my sunflower facts. Then I had my Congresswoman Deb Holland facts. So before I write about New Mexico, before I came on camera, I had to write down some facts about New Mexico. I always like to start with about eight facts, and then I can go and research more. So New Mexico has the oldest state capital out of all state capitals, but it's one of the newest states in the United States. That didn't make sense to my brain. So then I wanted to research more. Turns out New Mexico has had people living in New Mexico before it was even called New Mexico. There have been people in this area for over 12,000 years. So there have been people here. There have been people coming together and forming communities for thousands of years. I went forward and found some more interesting facts about the state of New Mexico. Today, I'm gonna to use comparisons to help me write about the state. Think about the state that you live in. Maybe it's also New Mexico. Maybe it's another state. Or maybe you have a family member who lives in another state and you would like to know more. Start by writing down some facts. And then today, we're gonna to try to use comparisons to help us write a paragraph. So to get you situated, our capital, that's where our governor lives, of New Mexico is Santa Fe. It is the highest elevated capital in all of the United States. Our capital, is 7,199 feet above sea level. Wow, that is the tallest capital in all of the United States. The capital, Santa Fe, was established in the year 1610. But New Mexico became a state in the year 1912. So Santa Fe was an important city in this area before we were officially a United States state. The Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, we have an, an event in New Mexico where hot air balloons rise into the sky. You may have seen hot air balloons in other cities in other states, but we have a festival that is the largest festival in the whole world. No one else has a festival with as many hot air balloons as we have right here in Albuquerque. Every state has a nickname. New Mexico is called the Land of Enchantment. Our state bird 
is the road runner. Our state flower is the yucca. In New Mexico, we are the fifth largest state. Out of all 50, we're the fifth biggest. There's only four that are larger than New Mexico. Do you, can you think of a state that is larger in size than New Mexico? Did you say Texas? Montana? California? Alaska? Those states are all larger in size. As I kept researching, I thought this was pretty interesting. Every U.S. state is made of land. But in New Mexico, we don't have as many people on our land. It's possible in New Mexico to drive and see no one around. In our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., for every one square mile, there are 11,570 people. In New Jersey, New Jersey is a small size state. For every square mile, there's 1,208 people. But in New Mexico, for every square mile, there are 17 people. We are the number six least dense state. There are actually more cows in New Mexico than people. That's a comparison. There are more cows than people. That word than, T-H-A-N, is a comparison word than. So just looking at this image, what is a comparison sentence that I can make? There are less people in New Mexico than in New Jersey. They both start with the word new. So I can write, there are less people in, since it's a state, I'm going to capitalize it, New Mexico than there are in New Jersey. This is a comparison. I have New Mexico and I have New Jersey. Although they both begin with the word new, they are not the same. New Mexico has less people than New Jersey. Now, if I look at 1,208 versus 17 people in the same amount of space, that's a whole lot less. So when I have my 17 people, I want to explain how there aren't a lot of people in such a large state. So I'm going to go right here. Because New Mexico in size is one of the fifth largest state, but in population, it's one of the smallest. That's interesting. So I want to be able to use that information in a comparison sentence. I'm going to start with the word although. Although New Mexico is the fifth, here I'm using a number, largest 
size state in the United States of America It's also one of the least. And we say populated, that means how many people? Populated people. It's one of the least populated states. In New Mexico, there are actually more cows in the state than, there's that word again, there are people. So what does that mean? It's a pretty isolated state. This is not a big city state. Our largest city is Albuquerque, but in between this whole state, we have our largest city, and then there is a lot of just land. As I continue writing, I wanna look at which facts have I included. So I said that it's the fifth largest state. I talked about the density. Now, if I wanna talk about how tall our capital is. I want to give facts, but I also want to compare it. The capital is Santa Fe. And what is important about Santa Fe? It is the tallest capital, and it's also the oldest capital as well. So I'm going to start a new paragraph where I talk about the capital city. When you're writing about a US state, make sure to include the capital city. Our capital is Santa Fe, but the largest city is Albuquerque. Think about the different states that you know. What can you research about them? When I write the capital of New Mexico, is Santa Fe. I want to use comparisons to make people understand. So if I say it's the tallest, it's the oldest, that's also a comparison. I'm going to continue adding this at home. First, Research a state. It can be New Mexico, like I did. You may find other facts that you want to include. Then compare these facts, meaning what do they mean? Why are your facts important? What makes that U.S. state different from other U.S. states? Please share that writing with us. It's been a long time since we've seen student writing. And we would love to see yours. We hope you learn something new. We hope you write something fantastic. Thank you for learning with us at home at APS.